So it is 7 o'clock, so uh, we want to get going. All right. So with that, I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is the regular city council meeting of March 18th for the city of Minnetrista. First order of business is um, like for all of you here to join me in Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, so with that, just again, a friendly reminder, turn your cell phones on silent or off or airplane mode so they don't disrupt these this meeting. So first, um, I'll do some introductions. Uh, we're going to start again on, at the very end with our chief of police, Paul Falls. Next to him is our um, city attorney with uh, Kennedy and Graven, Ron Beatty. <coughs> then David Abel is our community de um, development director. Brian Grimm is our finance director. Mr. Baroni, Mike Baroni is our administrator. Our administrator. I'm Lisa Whalen. I'm the mayor. And to my left are council members Pam Mortensen, Mike Molitor, John Chumperlin, Shannon Bruce. And then on the end we have our city engineer with WSB is Allison Fowski. And then city clerk is Chris Lindquist, director of administration, Cassandra Andra Tabor, and also with us this evening is our Superintendent of Public Works, Gary Peters. So thank you all for joining us, and also those of you that will be watching later on on YouTube. First, I'd like to um, the, uh, approve the agenda with one minor um, change, is I'd like to add Gary Peters under special presentations. He's going to give us a little bit of update and kind of a show and tell kind of thing. So with that, are there any other changes or additions to the agenda? Is there a motion to approve the agenda with that one change? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion has been made by Ms. Uh, Bruce, seconded by Mr. Chamberlain. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 5-0. So Mr. Peters. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor Council. I'm gonna hand this little part around here. What I'm handing around is a piece of the C900 uh, PVC pipe that uh, ruptured on um, Kings Point Road the other day. And I had the guys cut a sample just so you can kind of see. You, you hear a 20-inch main, and you don't know really. I mean, 20-inch, but that's a 21. That's a 20-inch water main that we had. Oh. He's coming 20-foot lengths, and it's severed for the entire 20 feet um, longitudinally along the pipe. Hmm. So as you can see, there's a lot of water in this pipe and that's why the water tower emptied out so fast. Oh. The worst part is where it, where it erupted was right in the low spot um, where a culvert crossing is and the water was discharging out at the lowest point almost at creek level. So we had a heck of a time finding it. Um, talking with Allison, what we've kind of decided is it looks like everything through there, since it is a ravine and it's kind of mucky, it looks like it kind of settled all through there, the whole pipeline did. And when it hit the um, concrete culvert there, the pipe settled, and as it kept going on the length, it kind of did one of these numbers and it started bending, and that's what caused it to sever. So um, basically when it severed, that's when it blew out. When we did release the pressure, the pipe ended up, um, the bottom of the water line um, here ended up six inches lower than the actual culvert itself. That's how much it had dropped. We ended up putting uh, 245s up and over and up and over for a 20 foot section. Um, <coughs> it's a temporary fix, um, and we've discussed that we are going to have to look at digging that up this summer. Going back a couple, you know, depending on how far it is, you know, we'll have to determine that once we start digging. But to get that pipe re elevated, get everything back established make sure the culvert is where it is and that wasn't the culvert, the, the culprit that pushed up, you know, and did that. Or if we think what happened was everything settled out around it, just being that it was a ravine and caused this. So we, we want to get it re-bedded, make sure we insulate it real well as much as possible through there because, you know, frost does kind of play an incident, but we definitely think that it was probably all settlement that happened through there. So, you know, but just to kind of give you that glimpse, I mean, you know, <laughs> You don't think much of it, but a 20-inch pipe is fairly good size. So, mm -hmm. and you can see how thick the wall is, and, and a half. you know, it, uh, yeah, it took a lot. And just, so you, I mean, you kind of saw it in claims, you know, right now we're sitting just about 30000 on the repair. We do have some of our overtime costs that are not in there, but 
excavation, you know, for the company was 17,000. Parts alone were over 11,000. Wow. And I did send a really nice letter to um, the owner of Plant and Flange up in uh, Blaine. Um, our normal supplier is um, in Eden Prairie. It used to be uh, HD Supply, it's now um, Corn Main. Unfortunately, 20 inch, of course, is not a commonly stocked piece. So we kind of scrambled to find parts and uh, Randy on a whim just said, he couldn't remember the name of it. He said, plant something or other. And we looked on the internet, we happened to find it up in Blaine. We called up there and talked to a Dustin Burness up there. And uh, he said, yep, I can get you. We got 245s in stock here. So let me do some checking around. Um, Dustin was good enough to go to the city of South St. Paul, who was a customer of theirs, picked up the needed parts that they didn't have on hand just for us, went and picked them up personally in his truck, brought everything back. By the time Randy got there, we had all the parts available. We did get some from um, Core and Main, too, that they had the main pipe so we could get it here faster. But as far as the big pieces go, I mean, they really kind of saved our behinds out there. Just, I mean, and he did a wonderful job. So I did write a nice email to the, I called to find out who the owner was. He's vacationing out in um, California at the time, but we did send an email to them and thanking them for everything that this Dustin did. And, um, you know, I mean, it just, it helped us. I mean, they were talking yeah. Core and Main two to three days to get parts in from uh -huh. Chicago. Yeah. And so we were there to get them that afternoon. So, I mean, it saved us a lot. A lot. Um, the other thing I really want to stress to you guys is we still have air in the lines. I mean, it's, as you can see, I mean, we've got a lot of water to fill and we ended up with a lot of air in the lines. I know we're getting a lot of complaints um, on cloudy water. Um, you know, unfortunately we did start, and I say unfortunately because well five isn't the best water, but to get Saunders back online, uh, North and South Saunders in the Pinnacle area and stuff there, we ended up firing up well five again. Um, and granted, it's not the best water on the face of the earth, but we didn't want to leave them high and dry because they did run out of water there. So that's where our majority of the complaints came from that area with the, with the well being back on. We are back on normal water. We have flushed everything. We still have air pockets that we're still trying to flush out. You know, you know as big as our system is, it's very, very time consuming, especially in the winter when we're digging out. I mean, Mike Pollock stepped into the snowbank. It was all snow, and he stepped down, and it was three feet of water mm -hmm. in it underneath the snow, and he was up to his waist in water. Wow. Wow. Unfortunately, I mean, he was drenched. I mean, that's what we're running into, just being able to try to flush. And there's a tremendous amount of pressure in some of these. We've actually knocked a couple of hydrants right off the mounts with the amount of pressure that's built up. So it's painstakingly slow, and you have to do it slow just to bleed off the air. You know when it's coming, you shut mm -hmm. them down, and... So, but we're getting there. We're just about done. We've got, you know, I think everybody's back online and getting a lot better water. You know, we're still getting some spotty complaints here and there, but you know, it's not a cheap process and you know, unfortunately it just happens. So. Yeah. You've had a lot of issues. I know too, with uh, uh, flooding and um, I think- We've had a number yeah. of frozen. We just, uh, right. Friday alone, we did 14 frozen culverts. We had to go out and thaw out and yeah, it's been, yeah. It's been a lot of work, so. Yeah. You can't wait for summer. I know the re I know and the I, residents. And I will never ever it. tell Mike that we are bored again. I, <laughs> I was the curse of death. Was I said, well, we're kind of bored. God, we're just so bored. I wish we had something to do. <laughs> and I keep never reminding again. him never say that again. As long as I'm here, and Mike's here. He'll remind me of that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no one ever say that. that. So, <laughs> but I mean, and my guys have been really good. I mean, it's. I mean, I, I my hats off to them. I mean, it's been long days, long nights, and they've really been doing a tremendous job. They have up, been. So. In fact. Um, so that was two weeks ago, essentially. Yeah. This last week's issue was the uh, flooding. So we on Saturday, I got a nice email. I won't mention their name. Um, but this uh, resident over in the uh, Hunter's Trail area said, my wife and I would like to thank Minnesota Road, Minnetrista's road crew, especially Gary Peters, for their work in repairing the flooding problem here on Hunter's Trail Wednesday and Thursday last week. They worked all day until nightfall. They realized they would need a larger pump and would need to block off our section of the road right in front of our driveway for the night. Gary came to our door. He informed us of the situation, let us know that, that the road, that storm, uh, the road storm drains had frozen. They had cut a path to the pond on the opposite side of the street to control the flood level, and they would be getting a larger pump and be back first thing in the morning Thursday. He gave us his phone number to call and said if he would aid us if we needed to get out of the house, because the water you don't know at that point, it was going to keep rising. The crew was back as promised Thursday and worked until it was cleared and reopened. So I know it's no fun to stand out in the cold and rain all day, wading through ice-filled water and slipping on the ice and snow. Thanks for their hard work. And so I thought he did a better job than I could of just saying, you know, <laughs> like he said, you're going to quit uh, saying we need something to do. But they've 
it seems like every week we get something new for these guys to have to go deal with, whether it's the tower freezing because it's 50 below or the feet of snow, a couple feet of snow we got. Mm-hmm. And, um, now this stuff, you know, it's in the, the pipe breaking and now the, the, yeah. the melt that we're getting all of a sudden. So, yeah, when I, I get it, crazy. reiterate, those guys work their butts off and they're, and they're well worth their weight in gold. And they've been doing yeah. a great job. So, yeah. And we appreciate it. Let, let them know that too. So, yep, yes. I will. thank you. Good Thank job. You. Thank Thanks, you. Gary. And I read that now because at the end of the item on the council agenda that has to do with uh, uh, the specs and bids for the project, once that's done, Gary can go. He doesn't have to wait for me to read that. <laughs> <laughs> I want him to hear it too. <laughs> so he's, he's seen that email. I forwarded to him, but I want you guys to yep. see Yeah. Um, and it's nice when uh, residents do, um, you, you always hear the complaints, so it's really yep. nice when you, when you get an attaboy, too. So, so that's, re- that's good. Them and thank them, so. Yeah. All right. So um, next, uh, there's nobody here for persons to be heard, so we're moving on to consent agenda items. It consists of A, B, C, and D. Let's approve our regular meeting minutes from March 4th, 2019. Approve the claims. C is approve status change for Jack Strauss and public works mainten- a public works maintenance worker. And D is a resolution to accept improvements and authorize final payment for the 2018 seal code project. Any questions on any of those? I'd like to pull B. Approved claims, claims. okay, Mm -hmm. so that remains A, C, and D. Is there a motion to approve A, C, and D? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, motion was made by Ms. Bruce and seconded by Ms. Mortensen for A, C, and D. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 5-0. Yep. On page 13 of our packet, um, the WSB section, I talked to Mr. Brony about this this morning, and I, I've, I've spoken to Mr. Grimm, too, about the categories of professional services and engineering services. And I was wondering what the difference is, what, why are professional services um, categorized the way they are? and engineering services categorized the way they are, they don't seem to me to be consistent. Um, and I was, maybe you can just shed some light on, maybe I'm just not understanding why you use professional services sometimes and engineer, er, engineering services at others. And the real reason I'm asking this question is someday um, with the city growing, it's it's going to be important to be able to look back and to run financial records to see what kinds of things a city engineer does because as we grow there's going to come a time when we're going to want to hire a city engineer and that's going to be a financial decision and we're going to need financial records to help us make that decision and I'm wondering if there's something that we can do to identify the things that WSB is doing now that in the future might be done by a city engineer so that we could go back and pull financial reports to help us make that decision in the future. Sure, yeah. Um, Councilmember Bruce and, and Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at it right here. It looks like. Um, Almost everything, for the most part, is coded to engineering services, like, like the one item's professional service on the... Right, and this the, probably isn't the best example. There are other... <coughs> yeah, I mean... It's where we've had a bit bigger mix of... Yeah, and I think some of it, I think, can, has even been if it's something, either a, a newer fund, you know, we try to set up always the, all the appropriate codes when either a, a new fund or if or something's new and within, whether it's water or sewer or... So for the vast majority of them, I think they, they are under engineering services. Sometimes the code might still be hit to professional you know, services, depending on if it's even, whether you know, a missed code or if it's not set up yet, yet you know, in that fund or whatever. So there's not, I mean, pretty much any of these 300 codes are gonna end up when, it, when it's rolled into the odd and stuff as basically gen- generic professional services. You know, we've, we've set up like engineering services and legal services to try to delineate them in further detail with for when people want us you know see the more detailed account code but um i guess as far as um you know you can see there's some of them that are on there for land use receivable those are billed back out to the developers um yeah and i'm not talking about those i'm talking about engineering services and professional services yeah i mean 
I guess the one that was on there for the, I guess the wellhead protection plan, sometimes depending on if it's more of a, well, I guess that, you know, I guess all of these are usually contracted out or whatever, or, you know, or they're separate, you know, engineering functions. So I guess if your question is maybe, you know, if you want them all to say the 303 code versus the 307 code, I guess that's. I think I guess if I may chime in, Madam Mayor and Council, mm -hmm. I've had I've had to work with finance before to look up exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. and so I think that the capabilities there to look back and, and break out what you're talking about for certain projects, if a developer's brought up, uh, that's come up before where they've had to look back and what did they pay for this and what what was that. Mm -hmm. So I, I I think I guess from the context of your question I think the ability is there to be able to, to look back and find yeah, out we what can run reports for. Just You're, the reports that you guys run all the time for yeah various things that, you know so I think the, the ability is there to, to break that out yeah in, in whether the future. it's whether it's um, WSB or Kenny and Graven, we, we do that a lot we can run reports right out of our system that shows this is all the dollars we've spent in a given calendar year fiscal year to you know this vendor or to like Gary was saying earlier for water main repairs or right, whatever can, we can right. you know, break that break out, that out and, and no matter find how that whether it's by financial line item or by, by, by vendor or by developer so. by you know yep yeah, yeah okay so yeah so there there really isn't a, any reason to use professional services instead of engineering services it doesn't sound like there is a reason i mean yeah really? I, mean, I guess it's all pretty much going to be engineering services i mean engineering services is a type of professional service i guess so okay um, I, I was just trying to understand yeah. why they were used and yeah for what and it's, i never could figure it out and it's yeah. probably because they're you can't <laughs> uh, well, it, it's uh pretty yeah much. i think you know looking at these brian it looks like you're using if i'm understanding your gl code correctly uh the first Three digits are the fund, so yep. like the 600 fund, I believe, is the water fund. Yep, 601. Yep. <clears throat> and then the next five digits are the actual account. Is that correct? Oh, uh, well, it's the department because basically, oh, the department, okay. uh, for 601 and 602 is a little different because they're going to have just their own water and sewer department. But especially for the general fund, you know, you'll have 101, and then like, you know, fire has its own code, police has sure. their own code. But basically, it's fund, and then the next five is are department level, and then the last three are what's called the object code, which in this case is you know, engineering service or professional service or whatever. And, they, and what you're saying is that those, the last three are all roll up to the same point when we see our budget lines. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we have those individual account line items in our budget, but ultimately when it comes down to what we spent in a year and when our, we get our final financial audit and stuff, right. the 300 codes rolled together, the, you know, the 400, but. So mm -hmm. it's really that second, that middle digit, five digits that kind of determine the account level. Is that a fair statement? Mm -hmm. Oh. So like the. Four four like four nine four four zero, um, four two four zero one department. That's department. That's yeah, depart department. Department level. Department. So it's where it's yeah mm -hmm. getting charged to as oh, far as what okay. department. So the last three is pretty much what type of item, you know, it is whether it's an engineering service, professional service, street maintenance. How many departments do we have? Because I see a lot of different variations oh. there. Yeah, there's a lot of different departments. There's, you know, even just within um, the WSB bill, there's uh, yeah, planning, a there's water, there's sewer, sewer okay. there's building inspections, there's stormwater. There's yeah, yeah. yeah. There's so four like, when we get down to, there's like, it's, uh, towards the bottom of the WSB section, there's three lines of 500 apiece for gender in engineering services. And there's a fourth one for 1,000. Looks like they're all the same description, but the department number's different on each one of those. Yeah, so basically. what you're saying there is in each case, mm -hmm. each one of those 500s is for, one might be for planning, one might be for water, one might be for Yeah, sewer. yeah it's okay. basically divvying, divvying it out based on, mm -hmm. on that, correct. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I think to your point, if you want to see how much we spent on planning for WSB, you'd pull that five-digit account. Mm -hmm. Right, yep. Yep. right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and to your point, I think we've tried to phase out using the 307 earlier. Some of them, I think, have just been, when it gets in the system and from a previous month or whatever, if it's been going to the 307. Oh, yeah, our, if you set up a vendor with a certain type of service, it gets charged that It gets charged, time. and we've been trying to phase them out, to your point, to have them all say engineering services, but some still just, because there's a professional service within that same fund also, so it's depending on... You know, when we get the sure. bill and there's 30 different projects or in this 20 or whatever, it's just a matter of trying to get through them all and down to that object code for each individual okay. item. So. Okay. Thanks. Okay. 
So then is there a motion to approve the uh, claims? So yes. moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. So moving on to our business items, um, one is, uh, our first one is approve a step program for the MOU for Public Works, and that's Ms. Cassandra Tabor. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Um, before you is an approval, as she mentioned, for the step program MOU for Public Works. So just a, a little bit of a reminder as we work backwards. Um, we entered into a three-year labor agreement um, between the Local 49, which are our Public Works, and the city for 2018, 19, and 20. We did that back in 18 and did the negotiations <coughs> associated with that. Um, the new labor agreement was finalized with the understanding that upon completion of our last hire for Public Works, um, once they hit one year, which is March 26th, um, the city would adjust the current six-step pay program to a five-step pay program. Um, essentially, we're eliminating step one. The goal with that is to make our initial step more competitive against our competitors. Um, as you probably recall, over the last couple of hiring rounds for public works, it's been challenging to find candidates. We want to make sure that we're competitive. Um, a market analysis was done during those labor negotiations, and we found that overall, our pay structure was competitive. Um, but that bottom step put us out of an alignment. It was significantly lower than what we were seeing for our area market. So that's why we were looking to eliminate that. Um, with this new step pay program, the city could, again, with future hiring procedures, which we're doing one right now, um, come across more competitive with that new step one. This was also done in this manner so that we could adjust the pay program without adjusting the pay for each of our existing staff members. So. That's the reason why we had our current employee who's gonna be hitting one year. Once he moved to step two in the old system, if we knocked off step one, it wouldn't affect just by default somebody's pay. So we wouldn't be changing someone's pay just so we could adjust the pay system. So it's kind of a key time. Um, part of that agreement was as well, if that new hire didn't make probation, then this would not take effect until we got through our next one. So. It just had a couple of moving pieces to it. So attached is the MOU um, to your item that we put before um, Ron Basil, who heads up the Local 49. And then this was something that went um, through the personnel committee as well. Um, on your item, it does lay out for you what it would look like between the difference between our six-step program and our five-step program. Um, but again, there's no change in pay for any of our existing, and it doesn't change the top step. So in essence, it just shrinks our range versus being as large as it is right now. And just an FYI, this may not be apparent to even Cassandra, uh, but I did talk with her about it. But the contract that we had have here in 2018, 19, and 20 is six steps. The contract that we had in, let's see, it would be 70, 15, 16, and 17, that three-year contract, that was the first time we went to a six-step. Mm -hmm. We had kind of the opposite issue. Our low was fine, but our high was not high enough, so we added the sixth step. Now we're kind of doing the back end. So essentially over, I would say, a six-year period of time, we've just moved everything over, basically based on market. Mm -hmm. So the contract that existed before 2015, was a five step last contract before this one was a six step this one is now a six step but with the caveat that we're going to take it back to a five step by as she said mentioned getting rid of the initial step mm -hmm. and that was you know does it sounds easy now to come up with, but you know we were struggling with that and during the labor negotiations like well i don't want to give a pay raise to everybody just because we're changing the step program you know it's like how do we do that? Well, we gotta have not have a step one. Well, how do we do that? Well, we gotta hire a guy and hope he makes probation. So that's why we did what we did. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to raise anybody else because we a rate because we felt like we were competitive on all the other steps. So mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. So um, questions. Yeah. I'm happy to stand for any questions. I have a question. Um, in in the memo, it says that our step one pay was really quite low, and I'm just wondering compared to what. 
how did you determine that it was low? I mean, did you look at what Orono was paying? What Orono so was paying? I'll interrupt you. So, sure. So I had <laughs> a chance to talk with Cassandra about that today, and we put this together. And on the left side, you see bottom of pay program in green. That's our new step, old step. And what are they, a dollar apart essentially, dollar ten, dollar Can you 11? make that bigger? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of blurry. David can do his magic here. I can go on the bottom right there on that sliding scale. Yeah, yeah. see if we can make it bigger there. Ooh, you got it. So on the left side of that page is the bottom of the pay program. And the bottom one, us, old step one, you can see we're about, a, you know, we're a good dollar below what we are now, but you can see we're, we're the lowest. And then I inserted where the new step one puts us. It puts us ahead of deep haven. But the average is 2330 of the remaining three cities there, Orono, Mounted, Deep Haven, and we were 2228, so we we're, or yeah, 2228, so we're a dollar two behind. Mm -hmm. Go to the right, that's the top of the pay program. That's our existing new step five, was old step six, same number. Deep Haven, Orono, Mound, their average is 2932, and you can see we're at 2879. So we're still on the low end, but you know, we're only about 50 cents off mm -hmm. that. So. As we stated in the memo, we were quite low on the, that end, but we're fine on this end. We're still kind of on the low end, but we're fine with that. Thanks, I appreciate you putting that together. Yeah, we talked about that and worked on that this afternoon mm -hmm. based on your question. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, um, I'm looking for a motion to approve the STEP program and the MOU for the Public Works. So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. The motion was made by Mr. Chumperlin and seconded by Ms. Mortensen. Any further questions? All those in favor, signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 5-0. So now we have approved the plans and specifications and authorized bids for project 01-19. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Before you this evening for your consideration and a request for approval, are the plans and specifications for the this year's street improvement project which includes mill and overlay reclamation uh, s removal and replacement of <coughs> pavement at city hall and then paving of ingerson a portion of ingerson road at the intersection by and large the improvements are um, actually the improvements are consistent with as we've discussed at the the public hearing um, with the exception that Kirsten Lane um, at Council's direction has been removed from the project. Uh, the, the updated costs are included in the packet. Um, that's based on the final plans that are in front of you this evening for consideration. Um, at this point, um, staff is recommending that Council approve the plans and specifications and authorize advertisement for bids. And we have a bid opening scheduled according to the, the specifications for April 16th. And then we would anticipate bringing this back to the council for consideration of award of contract at May 6th. Um, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that council may have at this time. This is pretty much in line with what we've been seeing. That's correct, mm -hmm. with the exception of Kristen, Kirsten Lane right. being removed. So, and these are estimated costs at this point? That's correct. This is based on what we've been seeing on the bidding environment thus far this year. Okay. So we've adjusted, we've been seeing um, the bituminous prices have been creeping up um, more than, um, than we had originally anticipated. So we've made some adjustments um, and then also looking at the um, actual extent of restoration for some of these reclaimed projects. We're a little further um, in the boulevard than originally anticipated in the preliminary design. So we have some additional costs in there. And so um, the total costs you have here at, at 864, 212, and then the budgeted amount is 842, 500. Primarily, or a big portion of that is um, the parking lot. So how do we make up that, that difference then? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, for bringing that to, to uh, as a question, and I should have mentioned this previously, is the City Hall parking lot improvements are proposed to be bid as an alternate, and that means that, um, that bidders would provide a price for that work, but it's, a, it's an option mm -hmm. upon award of contract. So um, at this point, with the majority of that work having been done on the front end of this project, uh, we've, we've 
continue to include this in the scope of pro scope of project for bids to see what the bids come in at if there's a, a contractor that sees this as an attractive project and perhaps we could get that uh, the city hall work at a lower cost that's why we've included it in um, in the plans and specifications for your consideration okay thank you so when you say you continue to see bituminous prices going up um, last year when we decided not to do any of the projects uh, it was because we were told that prices had gone up like 25 percent or some mm -hmm. crazy number because of a, a fire <coughs> of a refinery in Wisconsin I believe mm -hmm. so are, when you say they're going up are they going up from that level or from the level of the year before we've seen them we've seen them slightly higher than some of those projections um, if I recall correctly what you were looking at last year for budgeting purposes um, but we're still within the recommended budget for this and certainly after this bidding season we continue to keep track of these projects because <coughs> the prices can vary throughout the metro area um, contractors look at how close a project is to a major thoroughfare um, if they have to take a lot of um, county roads or local roads to get to a project that tends to drive the prices up so it's it's <coughs> there's a little more to it than just looking at overall average prices for the metro um, so we'll continue to look at that through budgeting um, as we as we come up to the next budgeting cycle uh, with the council so that we can um, we can to the best of our ability provide the council with an estimated project cost um, that's in line with what we're seeing with contractors pricing the other question, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the other question I had <coughs> is uh, bid opening is April 16th. Correct. And we're at March 18th now. And if I remember right, the packet that was about 178 pages. Is that enough time for contractors to turn around and give us a bid? Yes. It is. Okay. Seems like a lot of stuff to plow through in a relatively short period of time, and we're not the only city out there. So that that's a great question. So a project like this, typically, what contractors will do in the advertisement, it lists the estimated quantities, the quantities in there, and contractors can take a look at the quantity of material that's being placed for bid, take a look at um, the, the 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 plans. And they're, they're very talented at being able to get some costs together. Um, they have some good estimating software as well. I think that's a lot of them do utilize. Um, so we don't anticipate this being an issue with bidders taking a look at it. Thank you. So my understanding is if, if this goes out to bid and the parking lot bids come in lower, we can take a lower bid to do that. But this is saying that it's in all probability going to be 140,000 instead of 87. Based on the pricing that we're seeing, we anticipate that's that's our opinion of the cost at this time. Um, there are times where contractors will, in their bidding, put in lower costs than what we estimate, and um, that it may come in lower than that. But that's based. I mean, you might as well have it bid, but then if it comes in too high, we might just say no. Correct, because this would be bid as an alternate, mm -hmm. so it's not part of the base of the project. Right. It's bid as a, a, yeah. a an addendum or an amendment, if you will, to the project, so that it it gives the council the opportunity to say, well, we still want to continue with the local street improvements, <coughs> but the pricing for the city hall component is simply too high. Okay. And then mm -hmm. maybe the parking lots looked at in a different format, whether it's the scope of the project's change or it's yeah. quoted out or looked at a different set of contract. I mean, there's there's different options we'd have to going forward, you know, based on. Right. But it's good to at least see what we get. Yeah, maybe. I, I, yeah, it would be good to see what it would what it will cost, in and then. And and I would hope in the future it, that if the bids come in too high, that I'd like to stay within the budget that we had mm -hmm. for the parking lot. So Allison, if we decide not to do the city hall parking lot, the other prices don't change. Correct. Right, okay. right because it's an alternate. Okay, correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Good questions. Any any other questions? I had a question about that 178 pages that were was in our packet or not in our packet. Not in our packet because it was so big. 
is that something Mr. Beatty has read through in your, I mean, as, as a council member, and, and actually, I, I, I just want to say as a council member, I don't have the expertise to read through that. And a lot of us don't. Right. right. Tell what, if it's good or bad or what. And I, I think it also speaks to the need for engineering expertise for a city engineer. And we have that right to, there. Yeah, well, I, we I have know, that. But, but mm -hmm. it's, WSB is also the company that's proposing to do the work and doing the feasibility study and, and all of that. I, I think it having a city engineer to read documents like this to as an objective um, person to... Would add more cost. Well, of course. <laughs> but, it, but the things that they could, they could discover and, and it would give the council, I, it would give me more confidence that this is a contract that we're entering into that that is solid and is good for the city and and I, I trust Mr. Beatty has read it and can the 178 pages mm -hmm. no I think you Norm, usually our attorney will read contracts and and give us legal <coughs> advice that, generally our our engineering right. services are given by our engineering firm right. that's, so not like that's not typically in the packet in fact that's the only thing I could get when I pulled up the packet was that document. I couldn't find the rest of the packet. Right. It wasn't on the website. Right. I think what I what I noticed in the I did go through the, the 178 pages, granted not page by page, but a lot of it is what would be considered boilerplate language. Sure. So sure. it's you know, the common common right. stuff and then you and then I think the other parts are basically putting in Per city specification standards, we have you know, standards for whatever angles, you know, our crowns on the roads right. and drainage and slopes all, and all slopes of that, and all that kind of stuff. Right. That I kind of consider that to be mainly you know, standard. And standard usually, language. our public works will also be working with with our engineer on these plans as well. So we've got another set of eyes and, and ears on and it. This was, like, I think, to your point, Ron, the first time that I had been, since I've been on the council, I'd actually seen that. Right. right. Um, but I, you know. I, we operate kind of at the 50,000 foot level. We, I trust that our engineering firm is, obviously they've put together the package that you're using standard language and it's, that's, that's why I kind of asked the question about making, and I'm sure the contractors have seen the same stuff. This is not rocket science, or not new to them either. So right. um, it just, it can get to be wordy once you start putting all that boilerplate stuff together. It's, it's, it's a lot of money that's gonna be spent and it's a contract that obligates the city to do no, this isn't a contract. Well, but it, we're we're adopting the the plan, and I guess I'm uncomfortable without having some objective. I, I I was under the impression that our attorney would have read that, but you're not an engineer either, so right. <laughs> it makes me uncomfortable that that we're we don't have anyone on staff that can objectively evaluate things like this for the city that isn't a paid contractor. Somebody that works for the city that's paid by the city. I guess uh, the, yeah. my thought on this here is in, in this case, I, mean, I see your point, but I don't believe WSB would have anything to gain or, or lose for that matter, but mainly to gain from this because they're not the ones actually doing the work. If, if this were, if this contract were written by a contractor and given to us to sign, then I'd be concerned right. because we're paying the contractor the 800 some thousand. But this is basically our document that we've paid for. Um, so I'm a little more comfortable in that regard. So again, if it was a contractor saying, here, we need you to sign this 178 page document, then I'd be, no, we're paying you $800,000. We're going to you know, have our own team review it. Well, and, and WSB isn't doing all the work, but they're managing the project, and they, they do make they money on the win. work. That's why they're here. Yeah. That's what they do. So they, they, they're, they're paid separately from the 866, though, or eight, uh, number here. Um, yeah, this I, number, they're not. <laughs> I agree with Mike. I so none of, none of this money is going to WSB? No. Not no. a penny of this $800,000 no. no. is going no. to WSB. They're, they're contracts this is what it's going to cost to build these roads. Yeah. That's the, I mean, that's this, is, a, this number is not final. This is our <coughs> estimate. When the contractor comes back, they're going to say, no, we'll, we will do this for $1.2 or we'll do it for 500000 
that's the number we'll create to. But in managing the project, WSB earns but their fee is separate. We've already paid for that, or we're, that's that's a different resolution. That's not this. That's part of the professional this services contract contractor. we have with them, but it has nothing to do with this contract. Otherwise, their incentive would be to give us as many road projects as possible, and they don't care how many we have. Just that we they help manage the ones we do have. There's no financial incentive for them to have eight more projects if we could afford it. Madam Mayor, yeah. Uh, if I may, um, so in, included in, in, in budgeting is, is uh, I think to Council Member Bruce's question, um, we allocate for con contingency dollars, which is um, surprises that come up in projects, but also indirect costs, which includes engineering costs. Um, to answer, hopefully address another concern with regards to a city engineer looking at the, the project. Uh, it was a very deliberate process with the city of Minatrista in transitioning in my role as city engineer in Minatrista that I would not be the engineer of record for these um, for these projects so that we would have that separation between um, a project manager that would be the engineer of record for the plans and specifications and my role as the city engineer and um, reviewing this through the lens of the city engineer and not the project manager. So we've been trying to provide that separation. Oh, that, that's, that's helpful. All right. So um, any other questions or concerns by other council members? Otherwise, um, are we prepared to approve the plans and specifications and authorize bids for the project for 1-01-19? So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. All right, a motion has been made and seconded. Mr. Chamberlain, uh, Mr. Um, Molitor made the motion and Ms. Mortensen seconded. Any other questions? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Motion passes 4-1, Bruce dissenting. So next we move on to approve um, adoption of the Hennepin County Mitigation Plan for Emergency Management probably could have been on the consent agenda, but Mr. Um, Chief, Paul Thank Paul. you, Madam Mayor, uh, members of council. Um, uh, in your packet, you'll see a, a staff report as well as a resolution and the scope and purpose portion of the 2018 Hennepin County mitigation plan. Um, so I'll keep it short. Uh, this probably could have been in, cons in the consent. Uh, however, I felt a, a brief explanation might be in order as some of you are probably more familiar with this than others. But so essentially, uh, the city of Minnetrista has been part of uh, the Hennepin County mitigation plan since 2010. Um, this is a multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. So essentially all of the cities in Hennepin County as well as the county have entered into this plan together uh, as to create more of a regional approach to hazard mitigation. So the purpose of, of this plan is, is essentially um, to identify the counties and the cities within the county major hazards and assess vulnerabilities. So in other words, identify things through maybe incidents that have occurred in the past or just through uh, risk assessment in, in looking at items such as low-lying areas, are they prone to flooding or um, are there areas that might, uh, we get a lot of wind damage, so you have above ground power lines that possibly in the future could be put underground, things like that. So uh, I won't go into great detail, uh, but nonetheless, we've been part of this since 2010, and every few years we do review the plan and then update uh, accordingly. Um, so that has been done. Um, this plan has already been approved by the uh, state of Minnesota as well as FEMA, and so uh, as part of that process, the county uh, wants each city to adopt the update essentially by resolution. Um, and so that's the formal action that I'm asking you to take tonight. Um, and, and the so county has approved this as well already? Yes, they have. Okay. And a and number of the cities within Hennepin County have done the same. I have this the same exact um, task for the city of St. Bonifacius since we cover them as well. Uh, on Wednesday evening. So uh, I certainly stand for questions. I, I, before I go to that though, I should mention that this plan is enormous. It's about 800 pages in its entirety. So obviously I could not provide that in your packet. Um, the full plan is, is available for viewing at the police department. Um, and probably the more efficient route would be 
Um, there is a, a Hennepin uh, website that you can go to to view the plan as well, which is listed in the staff report, which is in your packet. So with that, I certainly stand for any questions, if you have any. And if not, then I would be looking for a motion to approve uh, this resolution adopting the 2018 Hennepin County Mitigation Plan. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Any um, motion was made by Ms. Mortensen and seconded by Mr. Molitor. Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Paul. I'm, I know you <laughs> You probably read this, but um, it would be a lot for us to read through, so really appreciate that. So moving on, um, on to staff reports. Mr. Baroni? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. I did include at the very last page of the packet a letter that we received here at the city on March 13th, last Wednesday. I thought I would include it into the packet, and I'm sure most people on the council are probably going to tell me, yeah, that's fine, but I, I didn't want to unilaterally make this decision, but uh, Representative Hurtas is uh, a lead in sponsoring some legislation. Um, I think the new governor has decided to kind of restore some of the LGA funding back to some levels that were 10, 12 years ago or 15 years ago, and Representative Hurtas is essentially looking out for the city of Minatrista and other cities there's about 70 or 95 as he mentioned where you don't get any LGA and we're one of them um, and so I just wanted to hear from council if they're in agreement that uh, for me to send the letter at his request saying that you know we're in favor of this this piece of the legislation being put in place so time is a little bit of the essence so um, like I said I wanted to not call you last week and ask this but f figured I'd just get a council uh, uh, I have a direction I have a question because the way that I read that second paragraph it says if adopted and passed into law the current proposed language of HF 2031 would result in an increased appropriation for the city of Minatrista for of 119,000 correct but my when I read that first paragraph, it says that there's his his effort would set aside two percent. Right. And, and I think he's talking different. about two percent of the thirty million dollar increase, but that would be divided up amongst ninety five cities that currently don't get anything. And I don't know what the formula is, is why we get one hundred nineteen of whatever two percent of thirty million for divided by ninety five is. I don't know all the math here, but. It might depend on population be, too. I, I guess it's probably population based. It might even just be the budget third, based. Might or? even just be two percent of that thirty million dollar increase for the for statewide. At least two percent of that thirty then will be split between the ninety five. Correct. Well, I don't read it as two percent of the thirty. Right. I read it as two percent of the entire. Budget. That's how I read That's it. Okay. Right. That's how I read it. Thirty is the increase. Thirty is the increase. Yeah. Is. And, I, and I don't right. know all the yeah. ins and outs of this right. thing. They're they're hashing that out in St. Paul, but. Um, I think what, what Mr. Hurtas uh, is saying is, and what Mr. Brony is saying is, are we in favor of receiving $119,000? If he's, if he's <laughs> successful in getting this piece of legislation, inclu including the caveat for the cities that aren't getting anything. So, I mean, he mentioned it that could the be that the Minnesota thing. That right now, certain cities that are getting their, their dollar amount, so to speak, they're going to be increased, but that would leave us out. Still out. Still out, because we don't get anything right now. So with his legislation, it would mean that we would get something, right. which, of course, would, would be great. So. And I, I, I support this on a personal, as a private citizen, I support this, because, of course, I want money for Minatrista. But I also have an issue with, a city council adopting a resolution for state legislation because we're a city council we're not that's what state legislators are there for we should deal with city issues and this is a state issue and I know it affects us. it's a city issue because it affects well, no, us it's a state issue it's a state bill and it affects us but as a city council, and maybe Mr. Beatty can speak about this, I know when the League of Minnesota <coughs> Cities has asked us to adopt resolutions for some of their legislative efforts, I've 
express my opinion. I don't think it's appropriate for us to be passing resolutions for state legislation. We're a city council and our purview is local government. And in my opinion, that's why state legislators are there is to do this. And I think he's asking that's us what his, for his support because yeah. he wants to know, are we in favor of this? Right. And so what you're saying is, yes, I'm in favor of this, but we shouldn't pass a resolution from a city level. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I think we can, we're going to have to agree to disagree on that. Because well, I'm not asking for a resolution. He's asking me to send him a letter of support. Right. I'm not asking for a resolution. So I wanted to make sure you were okay that I sent Mr. Hurtas a letter saying this city council is interested in becoming a participant and so we can get our chunk, whatever it is. And I think it's inappropriate for the city council to do that. I, I think it might be appropriate to say each private citizen that's on the city council supports this, but as a city council, I don't think We're not going to pass a resolution as a city council. We're authorizing or we're saying to Mr. Brony, we're okay if you send him a letter saying that we would like to receive $119,000 a year and that we're, we support that effort, that, that uh, you know, we're in like favor of receiving um, LGA money. You get a majority of the council that is right. in favor of me sending the letter, I would do that. Yeah. I, I, I quite honestly, that's really how things work in um, St. Paul. They frequently ask, well, are you in favor of this? Can you support this? Um, as a city council member and as a mayor of a city, if it benefits our city, I think that it's, it is our job to say, yes, we want this because this will benefit our residents. And I'm, I'm so. saying, yes, I want it. It will benefit our, resident, our and residents. And it makes... It's yeah. as a city council speaking it, to support state legislation, I don't think that's our role. And, and you're free to vote on it. I'll just vote yeah. no. And, and I'll just say this, too, that um, as a council, as a mayor and council members, our voice carries a lot more weight than a single individual. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're going to try and do good for our city, this would be a really good one to support. And that's, my, that's my opinion. And I have let Mr. Or Representative Hurtas know that I do support this. I sent him an email saying I support it personally, and I explained why I'm not going to support it because as a council, our purview is local issues, his is state issues, and I, to be consistent in, sure. in, okay. in how I've, I've, in my opinion about the League of Minnesota Cities resolutions that I've refused to vote for, I can't turn around and vote for something here. So I, my, my opinion is expressed just to be consistent with our past. Okay, so the rest of the council, are you on board with? I'm in favor. Okay. I'm in favor. I mean, I, I do agree with Shannon's point about um, in, in theory, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea for the council as a whole to get on either side of a, a state issue. Um, but from a practical manner, I do understand you know, what, what's being asked here, and you know, I think it's in our best interest to do that, and so I'll support it. But I do, you know, I do respect your approach on that. That yeah, it, it doesn't. It's not. A, I don't think it's a good practice to be because if this was a letter that asked us to support a you know an abortion amendment, would we all sit here and wave our support or not? That's not really our, our business, to your point. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, this, you know, I, again, I'll have to set aside the ideological pureness of it and just say that, yes, this is in our best interest and support it. Okay. Very good. Thank you. A couple other items that I have. Um, as most of the council's probably aware of, that we did have a phone outage last week. Again, you can chalk that one up to the weather with all the rain we had and the snow melt there was essentially a box as, across the street that got wet uh, so to speak and so it took them about 24 hours I mean we're dealing with uh, uh, a national company that was there was a lot of weather issues going on in the upper Midwest and so they were scrambled just like we were to and we expressed our you know dissatisfaction with it taking so long but I'm sure we weren't the only one but they fixed it uh, the guy said it, it's fixed he wouldn't call it a temp fix. It's better than a temp fix, but it's fixed. 
but he says there's going to have to be something else done later. We said once it dries out and gets nice out, so we'll have them back to, to permanently fix it, but uh, it's ready to go. And then I just wanted to follow up a little bit on our strategic, strategic plan. I haven't had a chance yet to work with staff on kind of doing the prioritization of some things, but I have had a number of council members kind of whether it's been in a council meeting or in an email or whatever telephone call talk to me about things that they're on their mind that are their constituents are asking about or whatever the case may be whether it's been uh, burn permits or road projects or nuisance ordinances or internet service or whatever it's been so we've got a lot of competing priorities so what i thought i would take tonight to do instead of kind of working that here in the meeting is just to let you know that i'm going to be spending some time on it working on it with staff and we'll come back with a plan but what I would like to get from each council member and you can send me an email or send me a voicemail just tell me maybe the one or two things that you took from the strategic plan that you thought were probably something worthy of being done in the next six or eight months um, we sort of have an idea of what that is but I wanted to at least hear from you and then we'll put together a plan and bring it back a timeline in terms a timeline. of when, yeah and which we'll, meetings we can't do them all at once yeah. but at least we can try to have a game plan and a time time plan for the year and it can be big or small the larger it is the more time it'll take so whatever your interests are I'd like to hear what they are hopefully some will overlap so it shrinks the number of uh, that we are going to try to do this year but that would be helpful because we still have to uh, um, kind of do that that's the kind of the next step with the overall plan so I know several things have already been mentioned at um, previous council meetings right. so um, maybe I know Pam has mentioned um, burn permits and right. then um, Mr. Molitor mentioned um, at our last meeting you weren't here talked a little bit about an open house for our 2020 road projects based and on the road projects, so yeah. Um, so those kind of things getting um, I've talked about it a junk ordinance um, kind of thing so getting those kind of things uh, getting so. those things um, kind of in the queue and knowing when they're coming uh, so if you have anything else um, get that information to mr. yeah we'd Baroni like to take a so stab at it as I was talking to mr. Molitor today you know there's there's a, a budgeting component to the road so I'm not sure if April's the right time because we haven't started our budget process for next year but we'll be into it soon enough June July and uh, maybe that's the time where we do it I don't know we'll just I'd like to hear from you just send me like I said of either a telephone call mm -hmm. voicemail or a, uh, uh, email with a one or two and then we'll go from there and we'll work on and bring something back to council so okay I think that's the easiest way to address the issues and then also just to kind of get you as a whole to talk about it. because I, I feel uncomfortable when somebody says we should have this on the next meeting it's like well I want the whole council to be able to say this is what we should have or this is this is the game plan we're adopting for staff to follow as a whole versus individually so that's kind of for our best interest but I think it's also in your best interest so um, I think that's all I have okay. any Others? Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of the council, I just wanted to provide you with a quick staffing update. Um, as you recall, we had posted for a building official um, as our, our building official gave notice and has since left us. And then we had a public works position as well. So um, with the building official position, we posted that we did extend it once. We had two applicants, one of which opted out for a private sector position. Um, the applicants that did come in for that during that extended period, their qualifications were similar, if not less, than what we currently have with Robert, our building inspector who's on staff with us. Um, and so David and myself and Mike met with Robert, who's expressed interest as an internal candidate for the building official position. Um, as you recall, Jesse was with us for a couple of years, which is about what we had, expect we had expected. During that time, we um, brought it to the council to bring in an inspector due to workload. And so Chad Bartley was on staff with us for that. Um, with the hopes that when it came time for Jesse to look for a, a different position with another city that Chad might be ready and in alignment for that. But he left us in the meantime as well for greener pastures. Um, 
Jack Mullen has stepped in over the course of about three years. Am I correct on that, David? Over the course of about three years and helped gap fill for us. He's currently doing that. He's been flexible. He's very efficient, um, but that is not an open-ended offer. He has other things in life he'd like to pursue during retirement as well. So we have him for the next um, probably a couple of months, we're thinking. Um, and so what we are proposing to do is um, give Robert an opportunity from an internal perspective because he does have higher qualifications than what we're seeing coming in and then look to post for a building inspector. Um, not that it's significantly easier to find a building inspector, but it has been slightly easier. There are quite a few other communities who are posting for building inspectors and officials right now as well um, who do pay more than we do. Um, so I think we're, we're a bit more competitive to bring in a building inspector. And so that's what we're looking to do as we move forward with this position, give um, an internal growth opportunity and hopefully groom someone who's gonna be here with us for a while and then bring in an inspector along with Jack being on staff with us here for a while too, to get those two people up and running as well. Um, and then with the Public Works, we've had four applicants for that position um, and we're looking to set up interviews for this coming week. So we'd like to move rather quickly on that as well. Yeah. All right, so. great, thank you. Quick question for you, Senator. Yeah. On the um, building inspector, mm -hmm. uh, you said we had one applicant that was kind of in line with- Building official. Um, building official, yeah. Oh, with Robert? Yes. Would, if we moved the internal candidate up, or in, would we have any ability or interest to reach out to that candidate and see if they'd be interested in the other position? That's a great question. I've actually been in contact with him up until this point because he's actually not qualified as a building official and that would absolutely be a next step is to see if that's something he wants to be included in and we would post as well. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great clarifying question. Yeah, I think okay. that particular individual is not in the metro and is looking to get back to the metro. To relocate. So. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, um, we go, we'll move on to council reports. Uh, so one, um, I got this um, invite uh, from We Can for their um, annual pr uh, breakfast, uh, which is coming up on um, April 11th, and everybody's invited. Um, if you care to join me in that, I will be attending. So that's uh, April 11th at 7 a.m. at the Gillespie Center. And then um, I also attended the uh, West Tucka Community and Commerce Forum on Wednesday the 13th. It was um, their first attempt at this and uh, the uh, forum was uh, very nice, but not so well attended, but um, again, it was their first, first attempt at it, so maybe it'll be, um, and the weather wasn't very cooperative either, but um, a nice forum. And I also attended the Regional Council Mayor's uh, meeting on Monday uh, prior to that and that's it. Me next? Yeah. Okay. Um, I attended the WCC meeting on the 14th, and I also did find out about the weekend event. So thank you, Lisa, for bringing that up. Uh, there was a speaker. His name was Dave <coughs> Scofault from the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry, Industry and it was very interesting. Uh, lots of active engagements with the members of, you know, small businesses. Mm -hmm. So it was actually a very... Uh, Good speaker, uh, and then I attended the night of community leaders as well. I thought it was very uh, well done, uh, and yeah, unfortunate with the attendance, but what can you say, <laughs> Mr. Mallender? Um, the last LMCD meeting was canceled, so I don't have any updates to provide on that. Okay. Uh, we'll be attending Pioneer's Hair Creek this Thursday. Okay. I had um, some conversations with some people over the weekend about the Green Step Cities program and uh, some of the people were from Plymouth that had sat in on some city council meetings where they had come and spoken to the, the city council there. And it started some conversations about this program that I just wanted to share with the council because um, Maybe what, what you should do if I, um, you should could I 
finish? You, well, hold on, um, because we shouldn't be having a conversation ab about that if you need direction or whatever. I'm not looking for direction. Okay, because I was going to say otherwise we could put it on the agenda for our upcoming meeting. And I asked Mr. Brony if that would be appropriate to put it on the agenda, and he said a more appropriate time would be during okay. the staff report. So yeah. that's okay. what I chose to do. Okay. So, um, so I, I went back and I did some research on Green Step Cities, and I think you remember when they came on August 20th to talk to us, they were asked, and I think Mayor Whalen asked, where does your funding come from? And I think um, Councilmember Mortensen asked <coughs> some questions too about their funding. And from what I remember, they said that they, they got their funding from some nonprofits, some grants and foundations, and I think your specific question was, so there isn't any state money, and it was, they made it clear that th there wasn't any state money. And so I went to their website, and um, at the bottom of their website, they list their program funders, and they have two program funders. One of them is the Met Council. They didn't share that when they came and spoke to us about the Green Step Cities program. And Met Council is not an organization that has local autonomy as something they support. I think the Green Step Cities is something that we need to be a little wary of because of their funding by the Met Council. And so I reached out to um, some other people and started a larger conversation and Representative Hurtas spoke into it and educated me on the fact that Green Step Cities is a repackaged version of what used to be Agenda 21, which, is, which was the UN Agenda 21 sustainable programs that they had outlined for federal, state, regional, and local governments. And um, I also found out that there are, are states that have actually passed legislation and passed resolutions condemning Agenda 21 because of its infringement on private property rights. And I just think it's, if, if this council is interested in Green Step Cities, and I, we talked about it at our strategic planning meeting, I think we need to look into it a little further and find out where, what their real purpose is, because I- And that's what I'm saying. Um, certainly, it's going to warrant more discussion than just right. a so council report. If, if we do intend to go forward with Green Step Cities, I think it needs a lot more investigation, is what I just want to say. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Okay. I think that concludes our meeting. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. Yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> motion has been made by Ms. Mortensen and seconded by Ms. Bruce. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passed.